presenting. This meeting is being recorded. Sorry. I'll be presenting the part two of the remoting AI. So, yeah. Uh, so here today, good morning, everyone. I will be presenting the uh, review of the book, uh, Rebooting AI, part two, uh, written by Gary Marcus and Ernest Davis. Last time we saw the first six chapters of the book, and today we will be seeing its last two chapters. Uh, the seventh chapter is Common Sense and the Paths to Deep Understanding. So we left it at a point uh, where we have gathered inspiration from human brain. And now we will be seeing uh, what are the kind of knowledge that we should be focusing on and what are the kind of representations we want to focus on to make the, to basically incorporate common sense into the mission. So before I go into the presentation, last time two questions were asked and I couldn't address it due to time constraints. So one was from Dr. Das. Uh, he mentioned that the jeopardy is not discussed. Uh, so the jeopardy is actually discussed in the book and I couldn't uh, in incorporate it in the presentation due to time constraints. So jeopardy is actually extensively discussed in various chapters. And the second question was from Dr. Michael Hans, uh, which is multiple systems are, are, is the author proposing to use multiple systems in the proposed solution? So I think at the later part of the book, probably in chapter six, the author is proposing that there is no one single system to solve the, the entire problem. It is a combination of multiple systems to solve a single problem or uh, each of the system to solve different kinds of problem. So uh, yes, that is also discussed in the book. So I just wanted to uh, start with the questions which I couldn't discuss, uh, which I couldn't address last time. Uh, now going into the presentation, uh, common sense and the paths to deep understanding. Uh, first, let's take a look at the list of common sense resources available. Uh, I myself was surprised that there are four available and I knew about only one. The first one is Snell, Never Ending Language Learner. It is by Tom Michel uh, from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, the everyday, so it it talks about or the goal of this particular project is to scrape the web for everyday knowledge. The limitation here is that- But, but I believe the data is not available for that. The paper is very well cited and very you know, well you know, uh, received, but is the data available for that? I, I don't think so. Uh, uh, anyway, the data is not, uh, the results are not very good. We had a long discussion. We'll, we can discuss this in the discussion session. But just as he says, uh, uh, no useful knowledge really. Uh, the quality of knowledge is not worthy of, you know, a knowledge graph ontological level use. Uh, pretty, uh, you know, it show it showed you know early 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 work and uh, shows limitation of knowledge extraction from uh, web content. Uh, significant uh, limit, significantly limited uh, work in terms of quality. As stated by the author, there was a limitation mentioned in the book. So there was no useful knowledge as in, um, we can infer knowledge such as uh, Paris, New York, LA, or types of cities, or they are cities. Uh, fruit, sorry, uh, apple is a type of a fruit. And that was the extent of the knowledge from uh, Nell. And the second one is ConceptNet. The idea here is to crowdsource ConceptNet from uh, sorry, crowdsource common sense uh, from people, uh, crowdsource common sense where people can go and enter the information. It is led by MIT Media Lab since 1999. Again, the limitation here is it has obvious facts uh, such as apple is a fruit, watermelon is a fruit and boiling is a type of a cooking. What are the synonyms for boiling and what are, the, what are its related terms? Uh, but we cannot gain any inference from it. The inference knowledge is missing. For example, after something is dead, it will never be alive again. So these kind of information still can't be found in ConceptNet. We need to build additional layers or additional knowledge representations in order to obtain such inferences. And the next project is Virtual Home. It is a crowdsourcing for procedures. Uh, procedures as in our day-to-day -day procedures, such as uh, to give me the procedure to exercise, give me the procedure to cook an egg and, and, and so on. It has about 2,800 procedures five, for 500 tasks, involves 300 objects and 2,700 types of interactions. 
The issue here is uh, it does give a list of actions to be performed. For example, if I ask what is the procedure to exercise, the but it returns only one procedure. What is exercise to me is not necessarily is what exercise to other people as well. The procedure that was listed is something similar to take the remote, turn on the TV, uh, go to the living room, lay out the mat, follow the video and do the exercise. Here, not the entire step is a procedure to exercise. Laying the mat and turning on the TV does not actually qualify as procedure to exercise. I can even go out and run. It's, it's very subjective and different. So it's not as comprehensive as one would accept. And the fourth one is CYC. There is no full form to it. I searched for it. It's CYC Scott. It is led by Doug Leonard for about 30 years. It has a team of people trained in AI and philosophy. The goal here is to gather human-like common sense knowledge rendered in a mission interpretable form. The issue here is even after, even after being active for 30 years, the information presented here is too incomplete. It is very narrow or domain specific in certain scenarios. Even then it, it seems to be incomplete. It cannot help us achieve the general artificial intelligence. So what the author tells us to make progress is to focus on two main things. One is have an inventory of what kind of knowledge a general AI should have. The second is representation of this knowledge in unambiguous and self-contained way. We will start with the second, uh, the, the latter representation of knowledge and then move towards inventory of what kind of knowledge we should be focusing on. The first one and on the easier side of the spectrum is taxonomy, uh, one of the knowledge representation techniques. It is a kind of categorization represented in a hierarchy. What it tells us is dogs are mammals, mammals are animals, and such hierarchical relationship can be obtained for um, all the objects or the objects that we know in the world. Some of the taxonomy examples or some of the resources where we can find this taxonomic information are Wikipedia, WordNet, and SNOMED CT. SNOMED CT is already a well-structured taxonomy in itself. The limitation of the taxonomy representation is that we cannot represent knowledge with vaguer boundaries. For example, was French resistance a part of World War II? Or how about the Soviet invasion of Finland? Is it a part of World War II or is it something that happened separately? So these informations can't be represented in a taxonomy. And other factual information or what we call as functional knowledge can also not be represented using taxonomy, which is knives can cut things, brooms can be used to clean the floor and, and so on. The knowledge that these two knowledges can actually be represented using semantic networks. The example that is presented here is from ConceptNet. Uh, ConceptNet, again, is a crowdsource information obtained, fr uh, obtained from layman people. Anyone can go and enter any form of common sense knowledge that we know of. So semantic networks can overcome the limitation that we saw in taxonomy. Here, we can represent information such as which parts are parts of which holes, which categories are inside which categories. The limitation of the semantic networks, or at least the con current concept net that we have, is that the representation that we obtain is not so clear. Not everything is explicit, and machines cannot understand what is implicit. And the people who crowdsource the information are layman people, and they do not know, they do not, not everyone might know that machines cannot understand what is implicit. So here, if we take a look at the graph, if we are in Ida's birthplace, it also means we are in Tony's birthplace. But that information is not explicitly mentioned in the graph. It can be mentioned in the graph, but it is not currently the current version of the concept net. Uh, and if an iPhone belongs to Ida, it does not belong to Tony. And this knowledge we humans know looking at the graph, but, but the, missions, the mission can falsely infer that a particular iPhone can be owned by both Tony and Ida. There are scenarios where that can also happen, but that's not the most common scenario. So here, it, the graph says that the iPhone has battery, but it also has other parts, which is not explicitly mentioned. And one other uh, shortcoming of the current version of the semantic networks is that we cannot encode a sense of time. So from this particular graph, we can 
the machine can falsely interpret. We humans know, but the machines can falsely interpret that Michael Jordan was six foot when he was born because it says Michael Jordan's height is, height is six feet six. Uh, the machine can also again falsely infer that Michael Jordan played for both the Wizards and the Bulls at the same time, which is also not true. Uh, the, those particular shortcomings can be overcome by uh, formal logic. The first statement here is, so these two are two examples of formal logic. Uh, the first statement here says that for every object X, if X is an iPhone, then Apple made X. And if there exists an object Z, I mean, the second sentence will be read as, if there exists an object Z, such that Z is an iPhone, Ida owns Z. So here it is an unambiguous representation. What we saw in the graph can help us infer, um, help them or can lead to three types of inferences. Apple makes all iPhones, Apple makes some iPhone, the only thing Apple makes are iPhones. But here with the formal logic, only the first one is a possibility. So these three potential inferences are reduced to one through this unambiguous representation. The, the limitation of the formal logic is it is harder to crowdsource because one needs to be trained in formal logic. But the author believes that this will be a way to move forward. So this is the kind of knowledge representations that we currently have. Now let's move into what are all the knowledge that we should be focusing on to move forward and think of possible ways to represent these knowledge. The author starts by saying that the first thing that one should be focusing on is time, space, and causality, because these three elements help us uh, help the humans perceive the world. First, for example, when we take space, let's take two examples. One is a vegetable grater and the other is a mesh bag. Here, the grater shape governs its function. It's trapezoidal shape where we have a handle on top to hold it. The bottom is flat so that it can stand firmly on a flat surface. It has uh, different textures on all of its sides, one for slicing, one for grating, one for grating in a different size. So basically, it's shape and texture is what it governs as function. The current systems we have can go and look at an image and say it is a grater, but why do we use it? What is it, its purpose? We do not have a system which can give us that answer. The mesh bag is an even complex scenario because the shape changes dynamically. We put a watermelon in it versus we put an orange in it, the shape of the mesh bag is going to change completely. If we have a robot which is trying to navigate in a domestic environment, it needs to understand that the mesh bag shape changes or takes the shape of the object which is inside it if it is trying to avoid mesh bag or, or avoid running over a mesh bag. So it, it is important for the missions to understand space and how space can actually govern some objects functionality. The second knowledge is the temporal knowledge. Let's say that we have a robot which is working as a first responder and it is the only available robot on call or in that particular period of time. It needs to understand that the fire can spread in seconds, whereas it may be okay to take a few minutes to go and rescue a cat from a tree. So it needs to understand which call needs to be responded first. And uh, the current AI systems we have are very good at predicting what is the next frame in a video. But if we see a movie, can we infer the time between the two scenes with respect to the story? The relation between one scene to the next scene, it can be a minute, it can be a day, or it can be a month with respect to the story which is being told. We humans can do that. And the current system, any system or any system that we have, cannot answer such questions. And we also do not have a representation technique to represent such sense of time. And the third one is the causal knowledge. Um, as per the author's words, broadly interpreted, causal knowledge tells us how the world changes over time. So if we observe that someone, if we, are, if we are sitting in a room and if we observe that someone turns on the TV, we know that someone has picked up the remote and pressed the power button. We can immediately predict, plan, and find explanations for an uh, action or an event that has occurred because we can understand the cause behind it. Um, here, it's noteworthy. I mean, here it's worth noting that we are working on um, one of we are working on actually causality, how to represent causal knowledge. Uh, of the three that the author has mentioned, we are heavily and uh, sincerely working on one of the areas, and Utkarshni's work focuses on that. And 
when it also comes to planning, the time and the causal knowledge plays a vital role. Uh, this is one of the examples, or actually this is the same example uh, we worked with Dr. Bipla when we were working on the planning domain, uh, making scrambled eggs. So this is a particular, uh, this, this is a set of steps given from, uh, given by the recipes from the internet. So beat the egg, milk, salt, and pepper in a medium bowl until blended, uh, heat the butter, cook until it is cooked and at, until it is ready to eat, et cetera, et cetera, and steps in between. The issue and the limitation with this particular uh, type of recipe that we obtained from the internet is it will leave out the steps which is very common or which is too, sorry, which is too obvious or which is too obvious to mention in the, in the steps. If we are using these information to train a robot to cook, it can be a problem because it left out the implicit steps such as getting the milk, butter and eggs out of the fridge, cracking the egg, taking, uh, sorry, opening the milk carton and putting the milk carton back into the fridge once it is done use, once we are done using it. These kind of implicit steps need, need to be also encoded into the procedure here. And the time, the sense of time here is important because without getting the milk out of the fridge, I can't open the milk carton. And without getting milk butter and out of the fridge, I can't take milk, butter, salt, pepper, everything and start whisking in a bowl. So the sense of time here is important. The cause of knowledge here is represented in the form of a cognitive flexibility. When I'm trying to make scrambled eggs, if I see a pan is, if I see that the pan is dirty, we obviously know that it needs to be washed before cooking. And if I'm out of pepper when I'm making scrambled eggs, it only means that the eggs may be less flavorful. But if I'm out of eggs at all, I can't make scrambled eggs to start with. I'm out of luck. So we humans know that what can be a limitation or what is something that cannot let us proceed further at all, like to achieve a given goal. So time, so it is important uh, to represent this, uh, to find a representation to represent this temporal and causal knowledge. The computer simulations can be helpful to a certain extent to understand or capture various forms of, uh, sorry, various knowledge of this causal knowledge or various facts about this causal knowledge, but it has its limitations as well. For example, if we take a video game, the Grand Theft Auto, it has a, a, uh, it has a nice simulation of all the physical objects. So it nicely simulates the interaction between the car, the people and every other object or every other entity that they have designed to be in that video game world. It is a form of causal reasoning because given an array of these objects and their functionality at T1, we can reason about how the world will look like at T plus one if the object X, Y and Z is attempting to make or do this particular action because it's a completely closed defined world where we know the functions of each of the objects and they are completely coded and simulated uh, in, into this computer programs. This can help AI. Let's say that we have a robot which is trying to learn to take items from a conveyor belt and stack it into an assembly plate. One of the scenarios, let's say one of the scenarios that we want to record as one of the data points to train the robot is that if we if the robot did not stack the boxes on top of each other properly the boxes will topple so recording such scenarios can be expensive can be harmful or injurious depending on what is inside the box if we can encode the functionality and the physical properties of what is inside the box uh, or what is what is the shape and size of the box these scenarios can be simulated and data points can be generated to train the robot that if the box is not stacked properly, it will topple. The, the computer simulations can be very helpful in a very confined uh, scenarios like this. But can we use this computer simulation to train a robot that is going to help us in the domestic environment? Probably not. Some of us have worked with this uh, Unity 3D. They have a data store for 3D models. If we go and search there, nobody, if we go and search there, it is, 
highly unlikely that we find the physical model of the objects that we find in our day-to-day -day life. For example, the greater and the mesh bag we saw, it's highly unlikely that we find those kind of objects in the 3D store. So it is a direction which can help us, but currently it is incomplete. We cannot try to train a domestic robot based on the objects available from uh, the 3D store no, because nobody has bothered to create physic physical models of the objects that we do in our that we do use in our day-to-day -day life. And extending the ability to reason and how computer uh, computer simulations can be useful in the causal knowledge. Formal logic to a great extent can also help us in the ability to reason. It can be a massive shortcut and it can help us to try and reduce the time and computational cost to use computer simulations to reason. For example, let's take an example, a scene from The Godfather, uh, where the guy Jack Olds wakes up and sees a severed head of his horse on the bed. So the inference that we can make using formal logic and also we as humans can make is that if Tom Page, Tom Page is the guy who plays opposite of this particular guy, Jack, uh, Jack Waltz. If Tom Hage's crew can get to Waltz's horse, it means that the Hagen's crew can, jet, can just as easily get to Waltz. And let's take another example. Uh, Rosalind Shea is a character from the TV series called LA Law. She falls off an elevator shaft and she dies. If we have the knowledge, if we have this following knowledge represented using uh, formal logic, such as an object is an empty elevator shaft that is unsupported, the bottom of an elevator shaft is a hot surface, meaning that if we can encode all the physical properties of the object, elevator, and a person, and what happens if a person falls from a height, a certain height, what, what might potentially happen to that person, and, and so on, using formal logic, we can infer that when, when Rosalind shape fell out of the elevator shaft, she was probably killed or badly injured. So formal lo logic can greatly reduce the cost of simulation uh, in certain scenarios. So having a large fun of this general knowledge about how the world works can help us, uh, can help, can help us reduce the cost of simulation. So formal logic in this scenario can be a massive shortcut. We saw how taxonomy, semantic networks, and formal logic can help us in representation of various forms of knowledge. Uh, and we also saw what are the other knowledge we would like to focus on to generate representation. But the greatest challenge is that the world is a complex, vague, uncertain, and an ambiguous entity, meaning that whatever the knowledge that we are trying to represent, it's a knowledge that we know, that we know for certain that apple is a fruit, or if something is dead, it can't be alive again. So these are something that we already know. But human, sorry, but the world is uncertain and it is ever-changing. But humans, we can adapt and manage to these changes somehow. So the these are the potential solutions the author is asking us to focus on. First is develop a representation to represent knowledge representation to represent time, space, and causal knowledge. The second is develop powerful reasoning techniques. And the third is design a human-inspired learning and reasoning system. By human inspired learning system, he's not talking about the neurons based on which the deep learning models are, uh, are designed, but focus on um, but focus on systems that will reason like humans based on or uh, given a set of knowledge, how we reason, develop a powerful system which can learn and adapt like human beings. And the last chapter talks about trust. So currently we have uh, when we take any engineering systems, we have various uh, tests that one carries out. But when it comes to AI models, we are not carrying out uh, these uh, these particular tests. For example, when we take a car, there is a intense stress testing goes behind it. What what is the breaking point of that particular metal or a material? But we do not test uh, AI models. What is the breaking point of the system? And the second is having fail safe options. Uh, one simple example is there are five five identical computers in a rocket shuttle because if one and at a given time only one is active. If one fail, fails, we have four other system as a backup which can get it up and running. In AI, we do not have fail safe options. 
And the third is we are testing every single system against Turing test. So the goal of the Turing test is to fool humans, but we are not testing the system to be uh, whether a given AI system is able to uh, understand and reason like human beings. So the author fundamentally questions whether Turing test is the right way to go about. And he is currently working with the Allen Institute of Technology to, to, co to come up with better metrics, which will measure uh, understanding and reasoning abilities of an AI system. And the next one is the program verification. When software developers build softwares, they do a thorough testing so that uh, the robot, sorry, so that the software does not reboot at weird times. For example, the software is installed in an aircraft system. They are tested and made sure that they do not start rebooting when the plane is taking off. Similarly, we do not want a robot to reboot the algorithm, uh, sorry, reboot the software which we in, which we install inside the robot when it is trying to help an elderly person by holding the elderly person and putting it, uh, putting him or her on a bed. And the next one is incorporating common sense to gain the trust of the users or to develop trust in AI systems. So common sense is knowing that dropping a person from the top floor of the building will, will kill them. Uh, and the last one is the creator should also, the creator of the AI model should also incorporate ethical values. Yes, dropping a person from the top of the building will kill the person, but is that a good or a bad idea? So the last chapter talks about trust in a lot more in detail. I have gathered only the points which can be, uh, which are very uh, important and I have included it, it, included it here in the presentation. And that concludes my presentation, image sources. Thank you, and I'm open for questions. Uh, one last point, do check out the list of suggested readings at the end of the book. He has, the author has nicely categorized um, the potential books that covers topics such as common sense, skepticism, uh, how mind work, works, and, and so on. There are about eight to nine categories and three to four books suggested in each of these categories. And I found that to be a useful resource. And thank you. Now I'm open to questions and discussions. I'll make, I'll make a few quick points. Um, uh, a while ago, when IBM's Watson was um, very popular and you know uh, Jeopardy game, uh, it won. Uh, we, Chris Welty, one of the um, uh, core persons involved in developing that, had given a talk. That talk is in our AI Institute's YouTube page. Uh, still, uh, you know, worthy of uh, listening to that if you're interested. Second, uh, we had taught, uh, I had done uh, twice before, a course on seminar on semantic cognitive perceptual computing. Uh, there is a link uh, in the chat uh, that uh, uh, we started that LinkedIn uh, group then and it still continues. And uh, that generally covers uh, the kind of things that you heard today. Uh, to some extent, there's good overlap. And uh, some of that will be also continuing in my, uh, probably the last course I would, uh, you know, give you this time uh, jointly with uh, Valerie and Amitava. So start in the spring, uh, we'll be, uh, you know, discussing the issues along this line uh, and, and others that, that really fit our research. Um, the area of expressiveness versus comp Competitivity versus afford has um, uh, been a constant, you know, area of constant, you know, that comes up all the time uh, throughout our uh, research, throughout our Gurukul's research. Um, and, um, you know, you may want to see uh, the, uh, the implicit, formal, and powerful semantics uh, that uh, 2005 paper, and there are many other uh, papers along the line, along the different time where various issues uh, about uh, you know, taxonomy and graph and other things come about and logic come about. Uh, uh, as I was exposed to logic a long time ago, I also talked about it quite a bit. Um, but um, uh, you will see that uh, you, you know, practically you have to uh, take the representational form that fits the problem. So one of the uh, you know, not too old example where we really had to uh, pay attention to this was um, the dissertation work that Pramod uh, Anantram did, where in his work, we chose to use probabilistic graph model um, and, you know, particularly linear dynamical system 
as the appropriate representative form. Uh, the interesting thing here is that um, it's a, a, a representative form where uh, um, both the statistical uh, or learning based uh, technique and uh, rule based and or uh, symbolic techniques uh, came into picture uh, in a different way. There were three ontologies that were used. And there was a very large amount of, um, you know, uh, sensory data that was used uh, and uh, also textual data that was used. Thereby, um, we had a range of uh, uh, structure uh, and, uh, you know, formal representations or, uh, you know, um, knowledge graph representations versus um, large variety of uh, unstructured data and or data where patterns had to be identified. And, and that, uh, you know, we showed that how, how our choice for that was, was appropriate for that form where we have billions of facts uh, that we had to process in the context of uh, multiple knowledge sources uh, that organize the whole field. So these are, there's a lot of uh, uh, work available uh, to further enrich yourself if you're interested in these issues. And these are some of the, more fundamental issues uh, in AI that will continue to be important. Uh, uh, they are mostly timeless. I'm done. I had a couple of comments real fast. Um, so for some of the stuff about, um, you're talking about cooking and sort of the fact that, you know, some of these um, knowledge graphs don't necessarily enumerate all the steps like retrieve salt and pepper, retrieve eggs from the fridge, et cetera. Um, it strikes me that part of the problem here is that um, a lot of the people working on this kind of thing haven't um, considered the role of expertise. Um, so there's a lot of research in cognitive psychology that deals with um, you know, how people acquire expertise and what are sort of the fundamental qualities of experts. And, you know, while obviously lay people are not necessarily, you know, expert chefs, they do possess a lot of um, sort of general experience. You know, most people have some general experience cooking. And one of the things that expertise research finds is that as people get more practiced at performing particular actions, they sort of collapse some of the steps and they don't necessarily think about them. And so, um, you know, if you've cooked most things before, um, you're sort of aware that, you know, refrigerated items will be in the fridge. And, you know, if you look up a recipe online, um, you know, that recipe is generally assuming that you know things like, you know, you need to refrigerate eggs in order for them to not go bad. And so, uh, you know, I think examining some of this expertise literature might provide some insights into, you um, you know, considering what types of steps people are likely to leave out, you know, if they're a lay person um, putting info into ConceptNet. And then um, another thought about um, some of the time aspects. Um, I'm not sure if Gary Marcus actually cites this paper or not, but uh, McCarthy and Hayes, 1953, um, the frame problem, if anybody hasn't read it, um, I feel like that's very helpful in sort of this thinking about things unfolding over time. Um, aspect as well, um, and sort of how do you group, um, you were talking about like the movie events and predicting the next frame in a, you know, we have algorithms that are very good at predicting the next frame, but they can't sort of predict what's likely to happen, you know, a month later in the story. Um, and then also on that topic, um, there's a lot of research in cognitive psychology looking at sort of how do people define events and what are the characteristic features of events and incorporating some of that information could be very helpful in terms of this defining, you know, this sequence of events and where are breaks in the story or sort of breaks in, um, you know, where breaks occur and then how to contain those things as individual events. Thank you. Thank you for the comments. Um, actually, Gary Marcus has talked about the frame problem when he was talking about uh, temporal knowledge and um, agreeing with whatever you're saying, saying, the author also talks about having domain experts involved. It's the current problem with the concept net is that uh, many layman people are involved and 
the knowledge that we find there is very obvious kind of knowledge and not of an inferential knowledge. So he also constantly talks about having domain experts involved and he draws various examples from a psychologist who has learned and who has learned about how brain works and how can we utilize that kind of learning techniques in uh, developing AI models, better AI models. Thank you. Yeah, and just to add, follow up to your comment, um, you know, expertise research um, has also sort of dealt with this idea about like who is an ideal domain expert to conceptualize, you know, what are the fundamental features of a particular domain? And so, you know, the idea being here is that, you know, because experts sort of engage in this collapsing of information, mm -hmm. um, there are sort of individual differences in who actually is a good domain expert. And so, you know, some people, for instance, can be really good at training new people because, you know, they have this um, sort of uh, mental model of the problem space where they can, um, you know, explain things well to new people versus some people who have sort of engaged in all these collapsing of steps um, are going to have a harder time enumerating all of the important details. Got it. Got it. Can you. I just follow up real quick on, on um, the important points that, that uh, Savannah is making? Um, you had, do have to think of the recipe as a representation and it has pragmatic constraints. So, it's possible to articulate all the individual steps that are involved in this, but that would not be an effective means of communicating a recipe to somebody who already knows what those steps are. So there's a pragmatic perspective that you need to apply on evaluating the contents of something like this recipe. We have another two minutes for questions. 